puts forth sweet herbs, shading trees. Puts forth sweet herbs, shading trees. A streams bound through summer meadows, fragrance blows on every blows on every breeze. They with happiness are blessed, who the Lord hath made their guest, who the Lord hath made their dwells the earth in gladness puts forth sweet herbs shading trees I've been in pain and yet been very happy. I remember when I had my open heart surgery and the um, cardiologist came to me and, and said, well, how, how are you? I said, oh, I'm great. He said, oh, come on, you've got to be in a lot of pain. I said, oh, yeah, well, but I'm very happy because I feel I've got, I've removed an obstacle to my uh, well-being. and." In fact, they told me if I didn't have a heart replacement, I mean a valve replacement, I'd, I could die any, any day. And so I, it was a necessary thing. But I was in physical pain, but I was feeling great happiness. Well, I know we've all had that experience in one way or another. I know I've been in the dentist's chair and have him grill away, and here I'm composing music. I mean, so there's this, this uh, pain going on, but why think about it? Think about something more constructive, <coughs> and so, or I do Hong So, or various things to keep my mind off it. You know, the, like the Chinese way of taking your teeth out, whether it's apocryphal or not, who knows, but the idea at least used to be that if just at the moment they're taking your tooth out, they'd bang you on the foot. And <laughs> <laughs> this is supposed to be good, I don't know. <laughs> But the thing is, and here is the point that it does relate to our talk this morning, our topic, that the reality that you're living is not just now. You see, we need to learn to live in the moment, but we not need to learn also not to be of the moment. And the more you let this moment, look at little children, that's all they know is right this moment. And the least little thing, they're either jumping with joy or just having a tantrum or unhappy or qu quavering. And you know it's not that serious. But uh, for them, it's the whole world. And then a few moments later, you see them running and laughing and they've forgotten it all. They're living right now. Well, that's not a good thing to do. It's a good thing to live in the present, but not a good thing to live in the emotions of the moment, which a long-range view of life helps us quickly to see that that's not the reality. Good morning again, friends. I'd like to start with a brief reading from Autobiography of a Yogi. 
uh, an experience in cosmic consciousness. Master is saying, I cognize the center of the Empyrean as a point of intuitive perception in my heart. Irradiating splendor issued from my nucleus to every part of the universal structure. Blissful Amrita, the nectar of immortality, pulsed through me with a quicksilver-like fluidity. The creative voice of God I heard resounding as Om, the vibration of the cosmic motor. My guru was standing motion motionless before me. I started to drop at his feet in gratitude for the experience of cosmic consciousness, which I had long passionately sought. He held me upright and spoke calmly, unpretentiously. You must not get over drunk with ecstasy. Much work yet remains for you in the world. Come, let us sweep the balcony floor. Then we shall walk by the Ganges. I fetched a broom. Master, I knew, was teaching me the secret of balanced living. The soul must stretch over the cosmogonic abysses while the body performs its daily duties. When we set out later for a stroll, I was still entranced in unspeakable rapture. I read that, some of that a few weeks back, but it also pertains so much to the topic today of a portable paradise. I think we sometimes forget that the practices that we have every day that we do are helping us to live in that portable paradise of peace, of joy, of love, of happiness. And as we uh, do everything that Master gave. We're creating a portable paradise of peace in the spine and the chakras as we hear the Om, as we see the spiritual eye, the light there, as our consciousness is uplifted. We're living in a heaven and a haven of peace. And all we have to do is look around at people who are near and dear to us, maybe, or other people at our job or people walking down the street. There's so much pain, there's so much suffering. Master said it's a self-created suffering that people have. And the yogi is a self-created portable paradise of peace. And I was watching one of the very beautiful uh, video clips that was sent to me from Ananda Calcutta, uh, a master's birthday, and I saw it again yesterday. They were walking down the streets near master's home and Tulsi Bo's shrine in a procession with a couple of trucks, uh, many devotees playing drums, playing cymbals, playing the harmonium, and just chanting God's name. And I thought, now that's a portable paradise of peace. And we have to know that it's there. We have to draw on it. You have to want it. You have to um, live in it. I was at a school yesterday where we're introducing education for life principles in Gorgon. And all of the children, it was end of the, that session and all the children received a certificate of the quality that they had exhibited um, and learned for that period in their schooling. And they received a pen with that quality on it. And they asked me to say a few words at the end. And, and I said, it's wonderful to have a certificate and to have a pen, but we have to really live it. Live the quality of peace, live the quality of joy, live the quality of love, live the quality of light. And not just for children, but for everyone. I remember one time I was struggling with something and and I I thought, oh, but life is so hard. 
And I'm sure you've thought that at different times. And then I thought about my friends and it's so hard for them. And this person's going through a health challenge. This person's going through financial burdens and this person's going through this and, and I'm going through all of them. <laughs> this is how the mind goes. And then I just inwardly ask master, why, is th why are things so bad? Why does it have to be so bad? And inwardly, I didn't hear a voice, but inwardly I could, I could feel him saying, what station are you tuned to? I've given you all these ways to uplift your consciousness. Use the tools, use the techniques. And this is what we have to remember. And I think people feel that if they go away uh, from the people who are bugging them or they go on a, a vacation and I've heard many people say they need a vacation after the vacation because it was so much chaos that people think if they uh, get away from problems or this and that. And But the thing is, wherever you go, there you are, isn't it? You're still there and you're the problem. And so we have to get out of thinking everything around us is the problem. The problem is we have to live in that portable paradise of peace, the portable paradise of love, of joy. Now, sometimes you feel you can't do that or the problems are too much for you, but Master said something very interesting. We have to keep it in mind all the time. He said that problems or uh, circumstances, circumstances are neutral. Now, most people don't believe that, but he said circumstances are neutral. It's how you react to them that colors them as good or as bad. But it's all inside yourself. When I was at Ananda Village uh, just now, I had this experience where I just, I was at a program and somehow I was just detaching from the scene and, and it was a wonderful scene but I could feel my consciousness was it was just letting me see the movie the show instead of being engrossed in it and as we do our practices we just get more and more removed from all the things that we think are problems and worries and whatever and sometimes we feel that God isn't there that we're alone and that we can't create that portable paradise. And, and I remember one time I was, um, I was in uh, Nigeria and I was, you know, serving there with Ananda. And uh, this was intense, I mean, really. Uh, but there we were and serving master. But after we were there a month and then another month and uh, two and a half months in Zimbabwe and South Africa, this was in the 1990s, 1991. And at a certain point, you know, there was nobody, was no linking with anybody there. This was too early for, you know, um, people to be able to contact us easily or the other way around. We got one letter, I remember, from uh, Dom Barra, if you're listening, and <laughs> God bless him. But uh, I remember at the end of that Nigeria part, and there was no contact with Ananda, that uh, we finally got to this uh, supposed hotel. And so then there was a phone there, and you could make a call, international call. So I remember calling Swamiji, and I, I was just desperate to talk with him just to have the connection and to feel his blessing and grace and and I remember calling and um, the phone was ringing and I thought okay I finally I get to talk to somebody I get to talk to Swamiji and so the, he picked up and I heard his voice hello and just to hear his voice was just it just was it really was so healing and then I said, Swamiji, Swamiji, Swamiji. And then click, the phone cut. <laughs> I could never reach him. I could never talk with him. And to me, that was a lesson. And you have to get it inside yourself. 
Yes, God is there. Yes, Swamiji is there. Yes, your guru's bhais are there, but you can't always lean on them. You have to get it inside yourself. And same when I served in Italy, there were a number of us there. And this was before internet, before computers, uh, laptop computers, before all the uh, social media, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp, all these ways we keep in touch. None of it was happening. It cost $3 a minute to call America. So nobody ever called. We never called. Nobody ever called us. But we had a picture. I remember, at, we had a mailbox and a picture at the back, taped at the back of the mailbox inside of Master. And we rarely got a letter. I mean, hardly ever. And um, when there was a letter, everybody wanted to read it. <laughs> Is that from your mother? <laughs> what did she say? But we would open the mailbox and typically there was nothing there, but we would see master's face smiling there. And he was just saying, you have it, you have it inside yourself. Go inside and you will find everything that you need. And so how do we create this paradise of peace? Well, whenever we chant, whenever we do Kriya, every Kriya, you're just getting more and more uplifted. And there's more and more bliss that you can feel in the spine and energy is coming up to the spiritual eye. There's more and more light. And you may feel energy and light in the seventh chakra and all the chakras. And so as we do Kriya, as we do the Om technique, as we do Hong Sa, as, as we are having Satsang and all the various practices we're creating, never forget. You're changing by the moment, moment by moment by moment, and you're creating this portable paradise of peace. And it may not seem like it, but after a while you see, yes, I feel more peaceful. Yes, I feel more calm. And yes, I feel more happy no matter what happens. And this is the result of the practices. And and so doing that, and remember, Master, you can feel that paradise, uh, portable paradise anywhere. Master said he wrote his poem, Samadhi, in New York on the subway. Amazing story. But he must have been in Samadhi. He said, and no one ever took my ticket. He says, actually, no one ever saw me. <laughs> he disappeared. He didn't materialize. Maybe we can't do that, but we still on an airplane or the train or wherever we're going or at our job, we just have to remember inside, I have God, I have gurus with me. And there is a, then Divine Mother can help us. There is a beautiful story, a couple of stories of Swamiji where one, um, he, was, um, he was in Calcutta and he had just landed, this was in the 50s, he had just, I think it was the 50s or 60s, he had just landed in India. And he, uh, some friends were to meet him at the airport and they weren't there. And so he waited for a moment and then he didn't, uh, you know, fret and worry. And this is what most people do. He just inwardly, this is such a beautiful thing to remember. He said he inwardly prayed. Divine Mother, what do you have in mind? And if we can keep in that center of peace inside ourselves and not, oh, I don't know what to do with them. Why didn't they call her? You know, he just said, Divine Mother, what do you have in mind? And then he said, within seconds, someone came up to him and said, oh, you must be Swami Kriyananda. I've seen your photograph. A friend of mine, Dr. Mishra, showed it to me. And and Swamiji said, oh, I was wanting to meet this. It was the same person, Dr. Mishra, but I didn't have his number. And, and the man said, oh, no, he's, he's nearby. I'll, I'm going there myself. I'll take you. And how beautiful when we can be in our center of peace inside. Divine Mother can help us. And finally, I'll share, most of you have heard this, but it's remarkable. Swami Kriyanandaji was... He had just finished the Raja Yoga lessons and he uh, wanted to take a, a trip with Divine Mother. This is the point. Think of God more. 
rather than the problems and the people who worry you. Just think of God. And so he went to, he finally found a room in Carmel, which is a very beautiful place on the seaside in California. And um, there was only like one room available because it was high season in that city, that town. So Swamiji, he said he didn't really have a lot of money, but he said, well, I better get this room because there's no other room. So the man who was there, he says, oh, um, he took his name and everything. And then Swamiji said, I think I'll pay you now. He didn't say why, but he knew why. He said, I think I'll pay you now. And the man said, no, no, don't, don't pay me now. And he said, but I, I think it's better if I pay you now. And they had been chatting. And this is the thing, make friends wherever you go with a smile, with a kind word, with how are you? How, how is everyone? How is your family? Nice day today, beautiful weather, isn't it? I always try to make conversation. And in the beginning, nobody really talked back with me here in, in India, because it's not cultural. But now everybody in the neighborhood, they all know me. Hello, ma'am, how are you? It's so nice to see you. That took a few years, but it worked. So anyway, Swamiji said, no, I think I'll pay you now. And, and the man said, no, don't pay me at all. And Swamiji said, what do you mean? He says, no. I, it's on us. Just enjoy your visit. <laughs> I mean, how many times has that happened to you? And then that next day, Swamiji went to have his lunch in the same town. And he's again chatted. He, he was able to allow that vibration to come to other people. And uh, the, uh, the man at the restaurant, the owner said, no, they were chatting. And, and Swamiji went to, he says, no, don't pay just enjoy. And so just let us remember, we have this portable paradise of peace and we need to keep it going in ourselves, but also share that vibration of love and joy. It doesn't even, you don't have to say anything, but it's just a glance with the eyes, just a smile. But instead of cutting yourself off from the world, um, be joyful, be loving, be kind. These were the qualities of our guru. These are the qualities that we acquire from our guru's teachings, from the techniques that he's given. Let us live in those qualities and share them with everyone who we meet. God bless you. And now I'll ask Pranita, who's with us today, to come on screen and ask the questions that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dhyanaji, for that very, very uplifting talk. You gave us many stories of travel in this talk today. Yes. And, you know, obviously that the beautiful story that Master actually wrote that poem, Samadhi, on a subway. Amazing. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, and here we are wanting vacation after a vacation. <laughs> uh, the first question is, I travel a lot and I feel exhausted from all the people around, the airports, the taxis. What can I do to keep my energy high? Inwardly, you can chant to the guru, chant a mantra, chant. Master said for us, the highest mantra is Om Guru, Om Guru. Keep a picture of master with you. When I would ride on rickshaws early on, almost 20 years ago in Gurgaon, before the auto rickshaws came, there were the bicycle ones. And, and well, I almost got hit many times. And I would carry a picture of Lahiri Mahashaya with me and that I'm still alive. So that must have helped, but you can do that. You can play the music of Swamiji or a talk by Swamiji or master. I just came from a long, long flight from America. I mean, there was, and a long layover, then a long flight from the Singapore airport back into India. And it was exhausting. There were people all around, but I, I came off very nicely. And uh, so you have to use the tools and not to be put in your closet. And as you travel, the other thing is um, you can get an astrological bangle if you can afford one. Um, and also uh, some, gemstones or Navratna or 
these are helps you can do om tat sat you know and maybe a couple of stretches in the plane or in the train um when you get off do double breathing uh maybe a couple of energization exercises the main thing is you want divine mother to be with you and, and i asked her and i asked master before i got on the plane please be with me and the trip doesn't have to go easily i'm telling you there are many things that could go wrong you could be stalled somewhere you can i mean who knows what but i just i pray to them please travel with me so i think that's Om Guru and the other mantra, travel with me. <laughs> I think are the best ones you can use. Great, great. Certainly, Dhanaji, you surely look energized after such a long trip. So Thank you. Absolutely. So we'll move on to the next question, and this is also related to travel. Uh, the question is, should we do the same amount of sadhana when we travel? Some people wow. say, that's difficult for me to do. Yeah, that's difficult. It depends on your schedule. Like, uh, okay, so when I landed back here, I needed some rest, you know. I And I noticed my meditations were shorter because I just wasn't, my aura wasn't 100% back. So I didn't fight it. I, you know, my body was saying, don't do a lot right now. And so be realistic. Don't let your practice go completely. But um, maybe it's shorter. Maybe here's the thing I would do no matter what, but you can't do it on the long haul flight is energization. Once you lose that, you just fall apart. That's my way I feel about it. You know, if you come back, you can't. I energized when I, as soon as I got back, you know, and uh, but I couldn't meditate as long as I would have liked. It took three, four days before I got back to normal. So be realistic. Don't throw your practices out the window, but don't uh, don't force your body. You remember Swamiji said once he told Master, "I'm I'm energizing. I'm af doing affirmations. I'm chanting. I'm doing hongs. I'm doing om. I'm doing." Kriya, and he said, I'm not getting anywhere. Am I not trying hard enough? And Master said, you're trying too hard. Relax also. So give your body a break when it needs it and then catch up later. Great. Thank you, Dhanaji. The last question, in fact, you touched upon it a little bit when you said that the first thing you do after a trip is you come back and energize. Uh, so this last question asks is, how can I recuperate or regenerate myself after a trip? <laughs> well i you know i travel a lot and uh i like to be practical and realistic in these talks you know i've had to have i've had to have physical therapy at different times because of all the travel the knee goes out your neck is out you know it's different things you have to put the body back together but energization keeps a flow of prana there and also yoga postures ananda yoga um so you have to and sleep you need sleep as well you know and um you know what i'm going to tell you this and i said this in another class but i'm telling you how i got rejuvenated in america i had a seclusion i can't go into a long time but i had five days by myself the thing I want to say is I shut the phone off five days. I shut off email five days. My mind was so relaxed after that. No WhatsApp, you know, all these messages constantly on the phone. I just know I'm going crazy. I cut that off and my mind just regenerated itself. So it's not just your body, your mind. It's going crazy. So at least once a day, I think all of our center leaders, it's a holy day, Monday, don't bother me. <laughs> so that's a mantra. Is so, so have a day when you just don't get into going back and forth. Hi, how are you? Emoji, you go back and forth, back and forth. And you got 10 people like that every hour. It's just like, I just can't do it. So cut back on social media. I know that's hard for people. Everybody's on it. But uh, if you cut back on that a little bit, you'll feel rejuvenated already. And then add all the other things that we said, 
go out, take a walk. I walk every day and exercise. Today I'm going swimming. You know, you need to get give the body its due. Not overly, but eat properly. Don't have five chocolate bars. You know, I need something. You know, you know it just your body's craving for nourishment and uh, maybe a little piece of chocolate, but you know, learn to be moderate and then rejuvenate your body, recharge it, and it will be your friend. This uh, physical therapist was saying to me the other day, he says, gosh, you're so limber. I said, it's all the yoga, energization, pranayama, meditation. He said, yeah, most people, just, they're so stiff. So what you're doing is helping you, but do it every day. Don't say, now I'm stiff, now I have to energize. Now I'm stiff, I have to do Ananda Yoga. And uh, you'll find that your body really, it stays, it keeps up with you. And it, it's always your friend. Okay, God bless you all. And thank you, Pranita. So nice to chat with you today. Thank you, Vyanaji. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye.